You're listening to the Zen of Dog Ownership podcast, where we teach you everything you need to know about dog ownership. I'm your host, Turk Akbay. My goal is to bring you the best real-life knowledge to help you be the owner your dog deserves. Dr. Stanley, welcome back. So happy Thank to you have for you having here. me. Yeah, it's it's awesome to be back with you guys. Yeah. Happy World Spay Day. Yay. <laughs> That's we right. To celebrate that. Yeah, we're recording this a few days ago. Of course, my wife Jill and you are here. Um, it's really good to see you again. And then, well, if you want, let's start with actually, you know, what's spaying and how is that different than neutering? So neutering is the overall term for surgically, alt- well, I guess technically not surgically. There's other things, and we'll go into that, but um, altering the reproductive state of a dog so that they can't reproduce. And spaying is the term that we use for females, and neutering is the term that we more, much more commonly describe at, for males. Um, some people will use neutering to describe both, but spaying is more accurate for females. So that's the actual surgical removal of reproductive parts in a female. Gotcha. And so spaying is not related to male dogs. Correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Although it gets confusing because some people use neutering to discuss. For both. Spay. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So it's World Spay Day um, on Tuesday, February 28th. And so does that include the neutering as well? I don't believe it does actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't think so. Although I'd have to double check, but I don't okay. think so. But we do want everyone to spay and neuter their dogs, what, no matter their gender. <laughs> yes. And we can, it, we can discuss both of those because there's pros and cons to, you know, spaying and neutering, although it's a different procedure, there are several, several overlaps. And often my answer will be similar um, when, when we, I get questions about the procedure in general, it's a different surgical procedure, but the pros and cons overlap greatly. Makes sense. Makes sense. Well, I'm excited to hear you said pros and cons, because especially coming from a vet for mm-hmm. all our dogs for a long time, it sounded to me like every time we went to a vet for whatever reason, especially when we had gym bear, it was like all the answers somehow found their way to, you got to neuter him, you got to neuter him. And I really wanted to understand. And when I ask, you know, of course, it's not you, but all the, our older rest are like, it's because you're a man, you don't want neutering. <laughs> I said, well, maybe, maybe not. But I like, what, what are actual like real benefits other than just like, just neuter your dog, it's going to solve all your problems. But mm-hmm. what are the actual benefits of spay and neuter? So there are several, and I love that you asked me to come on this podcast today because the conversation around spaying and neutering has changed recently. So um, when I got out of school, that was absolutely what we were taught. Every dog gets spayed and neutered. And in general, it would you'd be hard-pressed to find a veterinarian, I think, that doesn't recommend it because there are several benefits. Now, not every single pet, you know, we don't make blanket statements for all of our pets, just like doctors shouldn't make blanket statements for all of our people, right? We individually evaluate the health, the, you know, the environment, what the goals and um, wishes of the owner are. So it's, there's no blanket statements, although I would say that most veterinarians are recommending spay for everyone. We can talk about timing of that too. Um, the main benefits is population control, right? That's one of the first thing. And I think that you have to have a community mindset to obviously buy into that, right? Because you can say, okay, it's not my dog that's going to get out and get pregnant, you know, by the neighborhood, whatever stud. Um, (laughs) and And it doesn't normally happen in, you know, most neighborhoods. But of course, there are those facets that most people don't keep their dog on a leash. There are those neighborhoods where there are dogs running around. And so those are the issues. Um, so that's the first thing that I would say is benefit. Um, the other benefits are that there are hormonally driven diseases that we can treat or prevent with spaying and neutering, um, vaginal prolapse, vaginal hyperplasia, 
We're talking about males, benign prosthetic hyperplasia. Um, there's a lot of things, even, even mammary cancer. And this is where the discussion comes in a little bit. Um, we thought the prevalence of mammary cancer, breast cancer in dogs was a lot higher in our unspayed females. Turns out that it may be a little bit less than what we previously thought, but there is still a correlation. So the more heat cycles that a female goes through, potentially the more at risk that she could be for breast cancer later on. And that's breed specific to some degree as well. Um, to what breed? But that's the benefit. Uh, so boxers are on there, dachshunds, spaniels are more common. Uh, I think that Yorkies are on the list too. Wow. So for those dogs, it's a different discussion. Maybe we want to, you know, spay them a little earlier than our other dogs. Um, the other thing to consider is there are emergency emergencies that can happen from not spaying and neutering. Mm -hmm. So pyometra is infection of the uterus. That only happens in intact dogs. Or if you want to get technical, you can have a, a stump pyometra but that's a different, that's much more rare. Um, or something like testicular torsion in an intact mm. male dog. So those are things that are emergency surgeries that spaying and neutering would prevent. Wow. So it's population control as well as health benefits yeah. for spaying and neutering. So what age would you say is appropriate? Is it different yeah. for different dogs or is there an age? You're right, Joe. So this is where the discussion comes in because there's no perfect answer. And I wish there was because that would make my job a lot easier. Um, but it depends. It depends on lifestyle. It depends on behavior. It depends on breed. So, and, and it even depends on the veterinarian that it, you know, because we all have, that's where the practice of veterinary medicine comes in. So my opinion might be different than others. However, mm -hmm. at Good Vets and what we've discussed with my colleagues is that our General recommendation, and there's always discussions to be had, but our general recommendation for females is after about after their first heat cycle, ideally before their second. The reason for that is that normally they're more close, closer to fully grown by that point. Um, so they've gone through one heat cycle, they've reached sexual maturity, they're closer to fully grown, their risk of orthopedic disease decreases if we can get them to fully grown before we spay them. Interesting. What age does a dog go through the first heat cycle? Yeah. So that can change too. On average, around nine months. Okay. Um, for our smaller breed dogs, it can be closer to six months. You mm -hmm. know, for those, those teacup dogs, for our giant breed dogs, it can be closer to a year and a half. Oh, wow. Yeah. How about the and boy dogs in this process? Yeah, so that one that one's a little bit easier for me because they don't have that risk of breast cancer. So typically we're waiting we're a little bit more lenient with them. You know, we're waiting until they're fully grown, but that can be a year, year and a half. Now, and I'll refer to you for this, but there's also other factors that come into play with that, right? So are these owners taking their dogs to dog parks? Are they having behavioral issues? Does it make training a little bit easier sometimes if we have an aggressive dog? Maybe so. Um, so there's other factors that come into play. And that's all to say that sometimes we neuter a dog that has behavioral issues and it doesn't change anything. So it's, it's definitely dog dependent. But I would say as a general, if I had to make, if I had to answer your question, it would be around a year. So this is kind of very interesting because we're talking about population control. Again, mm -hmm. you know, when we had our dogs, they were like, balls got to come off quickly. Yeah. <laughs> and and Avishla was um, already coming from rescue. She was already spayed, so we didn't have to deal with this. Mm -hmm. What I'm hearing you with the new data, and we'll, you know, we'll talk about that too. But so now we have a, a, a female that's in heat and, a, and an intact male in a neighborhood. So it's almost a little bit more dangerous from population control. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Like, what do you think about Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Yeah. And this is, this is the hard thing that we're kind of wrestling with is because if you're coming, if your dog's coming from a rescue situation, most of the time, or, or a shelter, most of the time, those dogs are, are going to be spayed and neutered already around, you know, when, before they get adopted. So honestly, as, as soon as they can be, which I fully support that, right? Because that's a different, and again, this goes back to the environment of the dog, the owners at the time, 
Um, I support that because that the number one goal for those entities and that population is population control. So if, and right, the, the, the shelters have a little bit of liability, like they don't want to perpetuate their own issues that they're trying to solve. So I understand that a hundred percent. Um, if we have a dog that is in a home that is under control, doesn't have a likelihood of getting out, that kind of thing, um, then that's when we can delay these surgical procedures a little bit more. But you bring up a good point, right? And the number one dog that is picked up by animal control is an intact male dog, right? Because their drive to go find a female in heat that they can smell, I forget the statistic, but um, they can smell a female in heat for a very far distance. And a mile and a half from cross. There you go. Okay. We had a client who had an, a female in heat and neighbor's intact male was in their living room come through the dog door like a few years ago. So yeah, yeah they, exactly. It's nature, right? It's so um, yeah, I don't um I think that that is a whole different issue. And it's possible to, you know, have those everyone thinks not my dog, but you know, those th- I've heard those stories before too. So it's crazy. Wow. So just so I'm clear, I know, um, especially when our dogs were younger, it was like six months have been spayed or neutered. So that is definitely not the case anymore. Correct. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that if you had a a small breed dog that was fully right. grown around six months and it was a male or a, a male or a female, to be honest, I don't, I think that that would be appropriate. Would I suggest it for my Great Dane patients? Absolutely not. Mm, Right. Now, if I have an owner that's like, I do not want to go through a heat cycle because, you know, that takes, some dogs are really messy. It can Mm. last up to a couple weeks. Um, Generally, they have to wear diapers. So that can get messy in the house too. So I just had a conversation last week um, about this specifically. And the owner was like, I don't want to go through it. And we talked about the pros and cons and I was like, okay, well then let's spay, you know, closer to seven or eight months, you know? So there's always, there, there's another thing to think about is when you have dogs that are going through heat, um, the care and husbandry of them during that time too. Absolutely. Absolutely. So are there any like alternatives like, or yeah, what would be, are there alternative approaches, I guess? For, Males, there have, I'm sure, well, I'll preface this to say that I'm sure someone is working on it um, Mm. because it would be huge, especially for our females. Um, For males, I know that there was a chemical neutering drug Mm. out there that could be injected into the testicles. It would, um, I think it would kill about 40% of the testosterone producing cells in there, and that would render the dog sterile. So, The problem with that is that it was, it's hard to know if a dog has been chemically altered or not because they look the same as a dog who hasn't been. And so you never really knew. I mean, you have to do something else. Maybe they did tattoo or or something else. You'd have to do an additional procedure to somehow mark that that dog had had that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So if a dog did that, I mean, so how would that be different than just neutering a dog? It, like in health wise, health wise, they still have their sex hormones. Okay. So it doesn't necessarily prevent, you know, we talked earlier about that benign prostatic hyperplasia. Those dogs could still get that. Um, they could still get all the hormonally driven diseases that because they're still intact. They still have those hormones. They just can't reproduce. So that's an issue too. Hmm. Um, Because it doesn't mean that later on they wouldn't have to be neutered. Right. Right. Yeah. For, for females, there's not really an alternative at all. And, and to backtrack a little bit, um, the chemical neutering is actually not practiced in the United States. There was one manufacturer that made that drug and, Honestly, veterinarians didn't buy buy it, so they had to stop producing. Okay, um, and I can't I can't tell you if I if it's practiced in other countries or if it's more popular. Um, spaying, there's no alternative, so there's only surgical. Now, there's different surgeries that can be performed. So, in the United States, we do what's called ovariohysterectomy. So that's removal of the ovaries and the uterus. 
In Europe, they do ovariectomy, so just remove the ovaries. Hmm. They essentially are the same outcome. So there's no one that's better than the other. Um, and I honestly can't tell you why the United States does it one way and Europe does it mm-hmm. another way because mm-hmm. they there's no statistic there's no statistical significance about um, you know post op complications or anything like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, we remove all of it and they remove some. Now you can do something called tubal ligation. Um, it's similar to like a vasectomy, which technically you can perform in dogs too, but it's we never do. Um, right. the, the, the benefit isn't there because you still have the hormones being produced. And so you st- still can get pyometra, all the things that mm. those diseases that are triggered by those hormones. Right, right. Yeah. And does not spaying your dog, spaying or neutering health wise, is there any difference? Like, it sounds like there's more cons to that, like more things that could happen as opposed to if dogs are spayed or neutered, do they, are they able, do they get other, I don't know, diseases? Yeah. So this is a great question too, because there are some cancers that are more likely, or I guess more recognized in spayed dogs. But the question is overall spayed and neutered animals live longer. Mm. Is that related to the spay neuter status or is it just because of their lifestyle? Right. Um, Their care. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's too hard to know if there's a correlation there. Um, And then you think about, okay, if a dog is more likely to get this cancer when they're spayed or this cancer when they're neutered, which cancer is better? Mm. And yes, there are some cancers that have better prognosis than others, but you're essentially choosing one over the other. Right. Um, so that's where the conversation, ha- uh, that's why there's no good answer for every single dog. And it can always be a discussion. Um, I'm still on the, I'm still on the let's spay and neuter train for mm-hmm. sure. I think that mm-hmm. it would take me a lot to come off of that, but um The other thing that I would mention, and one of the reasons why we're waiting until, because I don't, I don't think I explained this well enough, but one of the reasons why we're waiting until the dog is fully grown is because we do know that spaying or neutering before that can, there is a correlation with orthopedic injury. So if we spay or neuter younger than when they're fully grown, they have a greater risk of cranial cruciate ligament rupture. And other things like hip arthritis and stuff like that. So that's why we're now kind of switching gears and waiting a little bit longer until they're fully grown because that risk does decrease. So what Uh, changed on the data? Because if I heard you correctly, when you started, when you finished vet school, mm -hmm. fast. And you must have, someone must have said, hey, Dr. Stanley, we have new data. Yes. And so I was trying to find this actually for you. And maybe I'm not up to date on the the latest, but when I was looking in the past few days, we don't actually have a peer-reviewed study out yet. Although anecdotally across the board, this is what veterinarians are seeing. And I think that we have, there's a lot of um, studies that have been done, but there's no paper written about it. So there, I think I I read one study that was 7,000 dogs and, um, and, and it showed those results, but there's no, I can't refer you to an actual paper that has been peer reviewed, you know, you know, all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's coming for sure. Cause then less discussion about it. Yeah. When we travel to Europe, you can clearly see male dogs. We don't know the female dogs Mm -hmm. in Mexico too, or in Turkey in different places. They're like, nope, we're not, yeah. we're not castrating. So it yeah. could be, they could be only traditionally their vet schools, maybe saying females just to be sure or whatever. It's very interesting to see different cultural, um, how they refer to this particular operation um, as yes. it relates to their, you know, their dogs. Yes, there is a cultural aspect. And I have definitely run into that in my practice. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of nudicles before. No. 
So um, this is something, it's an implant that you can put into the scrotum after you neuter a dog that makes it look like they still have their testicles. Yeah, oh my God. Remember Jill, when, when Jimbe was, uh, when they neutered them, they said, hey, we can put implants. If oh they, my God. I, I was so resistant. So yes. the vet is like, if you want, we can put something there so you can feel. Yes. <laughs> Oh my God. I mean, honestly, I will, I will, um, if we're having that discussion and someone is really, really hesitant, or if the dog has a disease that we need to neuter for, and then mm-hmm. owner's like, no way, it, it is definitely a discussion. Oh, wow. Oh my goodness. So you all do that. That's wild. Yeah. We, I mean, we don't keep them in house. We order them when we do have to, but anyway, sure. <laughs> they're prosthetic. We will, we'll get it. We have yeah. some marbles if you guys ever want to. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. We can just autoclave them, put those in. Dr. Stanley, what are some health complications? So like being transparent, right? So we're, this is world mm-hmm. spay day. So it's designed for pro spay. Yeah. But, um, you know, what are reasonable, you know, not not too fringy or whatever, but what are some complications that can arise from this procedure? Right. So just like any surgical procedure, there are risks of complications. And no matter if you've done the surgery a thousand times or two times, there's still risk, right? So the most common complication that we see is post-op, uh, meaning that healing of the tissue. And unfortunately, most of the time that's because our patients don't listen to us um, (laughs) and they lick their surgery site. Yeah. Now there's ways to prevent that. Obviously that's why we send every one of our patients home with an e-collar, that cone of shame to help prevent licking. Um, And I know that owners are, you know, sometimes I'll give a little leeway and say, if you're right next to the dog, you can take that cone off. But if you are not right next to them, then that cone has to stay on because Mm. Dogs can do a ton of damage within even a couple minutes. I mean, I don't want to get too graphic, but if that body wall opens and that mm. intestinal contents spill out, you you know that that can get messy. Um, now, the other thing is just activity afterwards. So that's a complication too. That can cause bruising of the surgery site, tension on the surgery site opening. Um, if we're getting into, you know, complications with the surgery, the biggest one is bleeding. So mm. with spay, you're, it's it, the unfortunate thing about spaying is that it's a little bit, it's a hard surgery. It's a complicated surgery, even though it is done all the time. So we are tying off vessels that go to the ovaries. We are tying off vessel, major vessels that go to the uterus. <clears throat> and those are big vessels that if they're not tied off properly, they can bleed. And if they bleed long enough, you know, that dog can bleed out. Mm. Now that would happen with any artery that you're, that you're like, yeah. Yeah. So that is a complication risk. It's rare. That's why we double ligate everything, meaning that we tie it twice. Mm. Um, We always check for bleeding before we close. So I would say that that, that risk is there. It's low. Um, Infection of the abdomen from, you know, poor sterility, is a complication possibility that's pretty low. Um, technically body wall hernia. So if the body wall doesn't close or heal appropriate properly, you can have an opening in it. Um, mm-hmm. overall. So it's really, yeah. I mean, it's really, I guess as a veterinarian, you educate your, your clients on how to best take care of their dog. Yeah. Right, like, so all of our clients go home with a, we go over discharges orally. You know, we talk about them. We send them home with discharges. Um, that's a sheet of instructions to things to watch for, how to care for your dog. I mean, mm-hmm. I think that the biggest issue that owners deal with post-surgery is actually trying to keep their dog calm. Calm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that everyone right. thinks that the dog's going to be down and out afterwards. And I'm like, it's like two days yeah. at the, or even a day, uh-huh. right? Like even they're ready. Day. By the time the next morning comes around, I'm like, they're probably going to be back to normal and you're not going right. to know what to do. So that's kind of the hardest part for me is we're, we're often sending home medications to keep the dogs calm because they're feeling so good afterwards. And so they right. do kind of run around and run in the backyard and the owners want to let them do it because they're feeling good, but that's where the complications come in or they take the e-collar off because they're not licking. And right. then, you know, um, and then, yeah. yeah, that's not, uh, yeah. That we work. get that question a lot. People say, Hey, should I wait to train my dog before or after, especially if they're close? 
Mm-hmm. We say, you know, your dog is going to be nightmare after day two with the cone. So it's always yep. better to get a few lessons so you can actually teach your dog to lay yes. in bed or walk yeah. calmly and things like that. So the impulse play, control. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. For yeah. sure. That is true. Is yeah. And I wonder with the spay and the neutering or male and female dogs, is the recovery similar or it feels like it's more invasive with female dogs? You're absolutely correct. So, and yes, I am a little bit more of a stickler about being more strict for recovery of my females. Mm -hmm. For the female, you're going into the abdomen and that holds all of your internal, well, not all of your, your abdominal organs. Mm -hmm. And so that's a big cavity that is very important. And so if things go haywire or there's complications, it can have greater ramifications for the overall patient. For a neuter site, Generally, we're doing what's called a pre-scrotal incision. So it's not even into the scrotum. It's basically technically between the base of the penis and the scrotum. And if there, if that dog is a little bit more rambunctious, then maybe the scrotum will swell up a little bit and it will mm. feel a little bit more uncomfortable. But generally, we're not, it, it would only affect the scrotum, not mm the spleen or the kidney or, you know, the internal organs. Yeah. 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 So that's easier to manage. Right. Right. And kind of along similar lines, but I wonder, are there any precautions if the dog, like if someone does adopt a dog that's older or I I guess if they were adopting from a shelter, they would have been taking probably been spayed or neutered, but what about older dogs that someone Mm may, you know, come into? Yeah. And I, it's funny where I believe my associate is neutering a an 11-year-old dog wow. tomorrow, actually. And the reason is because that dog is suspected to have benign prostatic hyperplasia. Oh. So the prostate's enlarged. And so the, the best treatment for that is neutering. Now, what we're doing for that dog specifically is we obviously check pre-op blood work. And as a standard of care for good vets, we do that with all of our patients, but we're especially paying attention to liver function, kidney function, Mm -hmm. um, and red blood cells, making sure that anesthetic risk is not increased um, due to some compromise to organ function. Um, Because the main main organs that metabolize drugs are the livers and kidneys. So we, we first are doing that. If the heart sounds good, meaning that there's no murmur and the lungs sound good, then there's really no increased anesthetic risk to those patients, even though they are older. So, you know, you always hear the saying, age is not a disease. That's true. We just tend to be a little bit more cautious with them because maybe things aren't functioning the way they did when they were two years old. Right. The other thing that we do for those patients is change our anesthetic protocol um, use different drugs that are better for senior pets. And that's where the individual treatment of each patient comes in. Right. Right. Oh. Turk, you're on mute. <laughs> okay. Much better. <laughs> so a few years ago, and I don't know if this company is still around and I get this question and I answered it one way, just <laughs> specializing neuter like mm-hmm. spay neuter clinics. Mm-hmm. And so people, you know, clients ask, is it better than vet or is it like, and I, I always think in terms of reps, I'm like, yeah, these guys are doing it all the time. And then I was thinking, well, you may be in a field hospital fixing a lot of veterans in a battlefield, but, you know, if possible, I'd much rather have a, com- a, a better hospital. Is there um, like is there a benefit or can you steal man the idea of using a somebody who's doing spay neuter or like is there a difference? I there's definitely a difference, and I have all the respect in the world for spay neuter clinics because we need them and they serve a huge benefit to our human population, obviously our pet population as well. And the main benefit is cost, right? Because cost for spaying and neutering procedures varies greatly. Now, the spay-neuter clinics are significantly cheaper than, you say, your general practice down the road or at Good Vets. And the reason is because they're using, one, they get donations, so they can help with that too. But, um, well, I guess I take that back. Maybe not all of them, but some of them do get donations so they can then offset the cost a little bit. They are 
faster in the procedure, I would say the procedure itself is the same. Sorry, I'm, I'm being, I'm being a little bit slow in answering this question because I want to be very thoughtful about it. They do the best with what they have. So they may not have the same services or provide the same services that you would get with your general practitioner veterinarian. So the pre-op blood work may or may not be there. I don't want to speak for everyone because I don't Mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. Um, The post-op care may or may not be there. The drugs used will be different. Um, Pain control could be different. Um, I, it's almost like you get what you pay for. And I don't want to say that you paying less is, is going to harm your dog in any way. I don't believe that at all. I think that their services are warranted. You just may not get a staff member staying by your pet until they're fully recovered. You may not get the long-term pain control. You may not get the cold laser therapy afterwards or pre-op blood work. Um, I am so respectful of spay neuter clinics. We need them and I appreciate them. There is also a market for the general practitioner veterinarian. The surgery, the outcome is most likely going to be the same. Um, It's just how did we get there and how quickly do these dogs feel good? What's the risk? Um, And how many people are watching your dog? And I can't even answer that. I don't know how how spay neuter clinics are staffing. but there has to be some give in some way for them to be able to do it at such a lower cost. Right. Yeah. And such high volume. I, we, 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 we lived in Noda. You can yeah. just see in the morning, there's like 12, 14 people just waiting for them to open. And then they're like, come back later. I mean, it, obviously mm-hmm. it's like comparing Costco to, you know, somewhere else. I get it. Correct. Um, yeah. So I you get it know, for to educate get- people. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to say, you may not get, you know, the picture of your dog in recovery sent to you. You know, you may not get to even talk to the doctor. You may only get to talk to um, a uh, technician. You may not get a follow-up phone call or even a follow-up, you know, visit included. All of those kind of things that um, that maybe your your general practitioner would provide. Yeah, right. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Are there any breeds that you know, like prone to post-op issues or that's related to this procedure? I think that the may, I laugh because I don't think that any veterinarian, maybe there's a few out there, looks forward or loves spaying a large or diet breed dog. Mm. And the reason is because it's a technically more challenging procedure and the risks technically are higher for those bigger patients. The blood vessels are bigger. Um, the, it's physically more difficult to reach those sites. If you think about, and obviously you guys probably don't study veterinary dog anatomy, but... Um, no, the, this is why we have you for, Dr. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Um, the ovaries sit pretty close to the kidneys and the kidneys mm-hmm. sit pretty close to the back. So when we have a dog on our surgery table and they're laying on their back, you have to get pretty deep in there to even reach the ovaries. So mm. when you have a Great Dane on your table, you know, you're in there and you have to go pretty deep. And so exposure is really important to be able to see those vessels and and the vessels are bigger. So right. you could have an increased risk of post-surgical bleeding. Now that also is compounded if you have a dog that you're spaying that's in heat. So when they become in, when they are in heat, the blood vessels engorge even more. And so we're try we try to avoid spaying dog dogs of any size in heat, um, just because it increases the risk of of bleeding during surgery and after. Right. Yeah, I would think that that makes sense. I guess yeah. unless there's an emergency. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. So how long? Like how long is recovery? Like how long should a person or a, you know, a pet owner expect the recovery to be? For anesthesia, the recovery is pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. For me telling my, my clients to kind of keep their dog a little bit more quiet, a week and a half, 10 days. And I, and it, 
seems easy for me to tell you. It's hard to execute because after a couple of days of your dog being normal and you kind of holding them back, it's hard to do. But right. if you can get through a week and a half, ideally two weeks, after those two weeks, you're going to be home free. It's going to be a lot harder if we have a surgical complication because we couldn't mm -hmm. get through that week and a half and mm -hmm. we have to backtrack and now fix something that's going to prolong the recovery period significantly. So 10 days and what that 10 day mark is, is the healing of the skin because right. those sutures, you know, typically, you know, at some, some veterinarians will place external sutures, um, some, some will place internal and those are absorbable. If they're internal, the skin should heal by that 10, 10 to 14 day mark. If they're external, most of the time we're recommending suture removal at that mm -hmm. 10 to 14 day mark. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's just is, healing. Yeah. And I wonder as far as keeping dogs calm, does that mean like no walks? No, like what does calm mean? Calm generally means outside on a leash. Okay. Um, so no zoomies outside chasing, mm -hmm. running the fence with your dog neighbor. Um, after a day or so, in my opinion, um, controlled leash walks are fine. Okay. So, yeah. And it's just so that they can't pull, you know, I don't want them leaping through the air, pulling on there, yeah. but if they're walking calmly in the house, that's fine. If you're walking calmly outside and this is where Turk training comes in very right. helpful. <laughs> beforehand so that we're not pulling all over the place that makes it way easier on the owner and the dog because that's mental stimulation too if they can't physically be stimulated to their you know max right. capacity, getting them outside just for walks is huge right and, and then I, I try and encourage owners not to let our small breed dogs jump on and off the couch all the time or sure. on and off the bed all the time we try and limit that too that's true that's true what about if they have other dogs in the house what should we do with the other dogs? Yeah. So this is a, a common issue to be honest. And I love that because I'm a multi-dog household too. So mm. I get it. Um, if we're spaying a younger sibling of an older dog, it tends not to be an issue mm. unless the older sibling wants to clean the wound. Right. Um, so we've had that where maybe a dog likes to lick the other dog's ears and that's not an issue, but once they're licking a surgery site, it does become an issue. So, you know, you can, you can separate, um, it's a long time to separate dogs. Um, you can get a little bit creative. Maybe we put on a t-shirt on the dog that had the surgery. Yeah. Um, you know, something that's probably less fun is a basket muzzle on the dog that's licking. Um, if the licking is the issue, the other thing is just playing. And right. we really have to be careful with that. And this is where I'm like, come on, guys, if we can get through a week and a half, I know. Um, let's do it. Because after that, then great, they can play forever. So that makes sense. We did yeah. put a t shirt on Zeely a few times during her surgery yeah. that she, she had. Um, Sometimes that's better. Even if you don't have a multi dog household, um, you know, you, whatever way you can prevent them from getting at their surgery site, whether it's a t shirt or an e collar. That's good. Right. In so right. yeah, there's multiple ways to get around it. You have to yeah. be free. I think it was seven that was licking Zeely. Seven was yeah. a clean, yeah. He was a cleaning his sister for sure. Yeah, he he did did a guy. And go in back the to earlier, uh, earlier. Oh, let me. Uh, yeah, I wanted ahead. to ask real quick too, like other dogs in the neighborhood. Like, do we need to tell, say, hey, like tell neighbors, you know, they just had surgery. I you think know. if you're out on a controlled leash walk with your dog. If they're ones that get super excited when they see another dog and they're jumping all over a place, getting tangled in each other's leashes, then yes, I would say something. Right. If they just to avoid that. And certainly we don't want the other dog scratching the abdomen or, or something. That right, can right. Otherwise, no, you don't necessarily have to say anything. Okay. Um, because just like greeting like normal, if they're well-behaved dogs, shouldn't be an issue at all. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, sorry, honey, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um <clears throat> Going back to the earlier operation that you're describing, is it is there a price difference between a male and a female and a small and a larger dog? Like it's, I thought large dog would be easier because a lot more room, you can move things around, but. <laughs> yeah, so it, there is a price difference because there's a difference in the amount of drugs that we have to use to get those dogs under anesthesia, pain control, that kind of thing. 
time wise too, you know, you're taking more of the doctor's time in a larger breed dog. Um, additionally, I would say for, well, definitely for spaying, it, it generally takes longer than a neuter too, because you are, you have a bigger incision generally, um, you're inside the abdomen, you, the procedure itself, you know, you're just tying off more things. So it, it is normally, I, I can't speak for other clinics for our clinic. It is more expensive for a larger breed dog. Um, and it's more expensive for a spay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cats, to be honest, the difference in cost is not at mm. cat That's our dog toys. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't should we even go there? I don't know. But <laughs> cat neuters are super quick. We don't even put sutures in those. Dogs, oh yeah, we we um sedate those guys and and don't leave the surgery site open. So it's a different procedure. So cat neuters tend to be the cheapest. Um procedure and a, a large or giant breed dog spay would be the most expensive. Wow. Okay. That's good to know. <laughs> so what can a dog owner do to make this procedure more comfortable for the dog? And this, you know, like, I guess, are there things that uh, a dog owner can do to help you and their dog have a smooth surgery and smooth recovery and, and things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. I think there's a, there's a lot of things and they are seemingly easy, but they take some prep work. And a lot of that honestly comes down to training because the hardest thing, um, if we have a dog that is super anxious, whenever they come into the clinic, um, that dog's pre-op medication. So we call it pre-medication before we put in an IV catheter, they actually may not work as well because the adrenaline's going, the absorption of those drugs is a little bit different. So having a dog that's calmer in a new environment actually does help us a lot. Uh -huh. um, yeah. So that's helpful. And then on the opposite end, when we're waking up from anesthesia, those if you go down calm in anesthesia, you tend to wake up calmer. If you are frantic or anxious or um, nervous, those dogs wake up a little bit more frantic yeah. and anxious and nervous. Now, there are things that we do to mitigate that, right? We have other drugs that we can use. We'll sit with them on our lap. I've done it plenty of times in a run until they are calm if they wake up a little anxious from anesthesia. So um, there's definitely things that we do to try and help prevent that, but th there's a huge difference, um, in, in how they come in. And then I would say post surgically to, you know, if your dog is very, very active and they don't have those, that training beforehand, you know, those, that week and a half is going to be a challenge for you. And so putting that effort into training on the front end, is worth its weight in spades because then you're less likely to have complications. Your dog's going to be more mentally balanced. Um, that, that disruption in their normal everyday life isn't going to take as much of a toll. Absolutely. Especially if we're waiting longer and longer for dogs to be spayed or neutered. Yeah. It you have a little sense. bit more time to get that, those kind of base values. I don't Absolutely. want to say values, but you know, practices. Behaviors. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are fat dogs harder to operate on? They are, yes. Mm -hmm. And that's because their subcutaneous fat is thicker. So you have a thicker... What's um, subcutaneous fat? Sorry. Sub, oh, no, great question. So it, there's layers to the skin and the external layer, the epidermis, and then you have the subcutaneous layer, which is the fatty layer, and then you have the body wall. So the more overweight a dog is, the, the, the more fat cells are in that subcutaneous layer. So it's just more physical distance to reach that body wall. Additionally, we also have more fat intra abdominally. And so there's just, <laughs> this is going to get pretty, it's greasy in there. And so Ooh. it's harder to hold on to vessels. It's, you know, Ooh. you're wiping off your, I know this is a little bit technical. I don't want to freak anyone out, but uh, you're wiping off your surgery gloves because it feels wow. oily in the abdomen mm -hmm. and there are, you know, pockets of fat and it, I guess pocket implies that it's a liquid, it's a fatty tissue. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you have to, you have to work around that. Wow. Um, 
So it is harder. We, a, a large fat dog spay, it's a hard surgery. Oh man, y'all well, keep your often, dogs healthy. <laughs> yeah, we're often honest with our the customers. We'll say, hey, your dog can lose a few pounds. Yeah. You know? Of course, it's it must be harder. We uh, can do a podcast later on overweight dogs. And <laughs> it's beautiful. Right. Yeah, we'll do that. That's a great, great well, idea. It's so much harder on the dogs, but yes, for sure. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, all the things that we worry about in people, it translates to our Same. dogs. Yeah. For post-operation, other than keeping the dog calm, are there other things like apply ice on it or, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know, should they take medication? Yeah. Other than keeping the dog calm, are there anything that they can help their dogs, the owners can help their dogs? Yeah, we actually make it super easy on owners and we generally tell them not to touch the incision. Um, I want my owners to look at the incision ideally a couple times a day to make sure that we don't have increased swelling, increased redness, any discharge. But I actually ask that n- them not to touch it. And there's a couple of reasons. One, it, it, you increase ri- the more contact with that surgery site, the more risk that we have for potential contamination of it. Um, I haven't had anyone ask me about about applying ice. And in all honesty, I'd probably tell them not to only because it can be irritating. There's nuances to how that should be done and, and other potential complications like damaging the tissue. And Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't change in my opinion. It doesn't increase the recovery, sorry, decrease the recovery time or increase the pain control significantly Mm -hmm. enough for it to be worth it. Honestly, I don't know if you'd be able to get your dog to lay down for that long and tolerate it. Right. So right. that's another hard thing too. So no, I mean, besides giving the pain control and if needed, the you know medication to keep them calmer, making sure that they have their e-collar or their t-shirt on, and then just keeping them, you know, kind of restricted for 10 days. There's not a lot more that we ask owners to do. Yeah, but e-collar, this like if anybody's an entrepreneur. That's something that is a great investment to fix it from that hard oh. corn. corn. Yes. Like dogs don't appreciate it. They run into things. Their necks hurt. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so. I, we have we have that classic one that you're talking about. There's something called the calming collar that we also have. And it's a little bit better. It, it's never going to be perfect. But the calming collar is Velcro instead. And it's a little bit softer. They've lined it with a almost like a felt material that um, is light blue. And studies have shown that that technically that color is calming for dogs. So um, there's something called a calming collar. Or have you seen the donuts, the blow up collars? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I've seen them fail a couple of times. If your dog's really long and the snout is really long, then they may, and location of, you know, if we're talking about other surgeries, location of the surgery, um, in general, that work for space just fine. But those those are an option too. I suggest some people to put it upside down so it kind of looks like a skirt around the neck because <laughs> it still prevents them from being able to read sometime. But Yeah, depending on the location. Yeah, yeah. I've actually never seen that done. So I'll have to try <laughs> that on my own dogs. <laughs> so what are some myths and like quirky stuff that you heard people like are there any myths that you want to demystify and say hey this is not right like I think the biggest, the biggest myth is that spaying and neutering is going to make your dog fat mm-hmm. and there's a little bit of truth to it I have to say because when you take away those hormones the metabolism will decrease but spaying and neutering in itself does not make your dog fat. What makes your dog fat, and I hate even overweight, is it too many calories and too little exercise. And so when we spay or neuter a dog, we may have to change how much we're feeding them or the type of food that we're feeding them and you know, reconsider you know, increasing exercise and all that kind of stuff. But that doesn't mean that spaying and neutering makes your dog fat. Can it change some things in their metabolism yes but we we think about that and we make the necessary changes to their diet Mm. um i think the other thing that some people think is that spaying and neutering is going to change behavior and in some cases maybe as i alluded to earlier that might be the goal um especially in a young maybe very reactive male dog 
sometimes we try that to see if testosterone, it's testosterone driven. Mm-hmm. Um, if we're waiting a little bit later to spay and neuter, we don't, we don't get those changes because then the behavior is ingrained. Um, it's a lot harder to change that just with spaying and neutering. So th- there's no behavior changes that happen with that. Now, if, of course, if you have a spayed or a, an intact dog that is agreeable to the advances of a male dog, you know, you know, after spaying, that's going to change. So in that way, that behavior is changing. But as far as their personality, um, that doesn't change. We get that question yeah. all the time, especially yeah. when people are having problems. They say, hey, is castration mm-hmm. is going to fix the problem? And I said, no, it doesn't. No. But from from our perspective, because like when we had my Ridgeback, Jimbe, I was anti-neutering. Um, Mm-hmm. For a long time, it took a, a long time for our vet to convince me. <clears throat> One thing that we know, and I share this with our customers, it cut down, like as soon as he was neutered, it cut down from other dogs from attacking him. We couldn't yes. go into a dog park. Dogs used to rush, literally rush to the uh, you know the border, barking, throwing gang signs. They're like, hey! <laughs> and uh, now... I, of course, as I became a dog trainer, I understand because they smell differently. The dogs that are, I call it Brad Pitt syndrome, the dogs that are, you know, not intact, when there's an intact male, it's an immediate discomfort and threat to the existence of neutered males. So yep. they tend to attack more. It's like a Napoleon complex or whatever. So it was a much more peaceful life for Jimbe. Because you could go to more places. Yeah, there wasn't as much push. And and I have seen that too, where it may not have had a behavioral impact on your own dog. But what you're saying is that the behavior of other dogs towards your dog changed. And yes, that's absolutely correct. Yep. Yeah, that's great. It's the hormones. Mm. Um, all right. I don't have any more questions left. Thank you so much for your time. Um, did we miss anything out? Like Because you're from the field. I don't think so. I think that the main the main thing that I wanted to highlight today, my main goal was pro. I am pro in the veterinary community is still very pro spay and neutering. There's a lot of benefits, but I want to recognize that the discussion around spaying and neutering has changed. And we are recognizing that there are different forces that can make that can form our decision and the timing, and that there's no one right answer for your dog. Um, that's a conversation between you and your veterinarian. And, um, I still think that it should be done at some point and hopefully, you know, within the first year or two, but, um, there's certainly a discussion to be had and it's kind of new and exciting in vet med because it's been sterile for a long time. So it's fun to, fun to continue to learn about this stuff. Yeah. Thank Thank you. you so much. We always appreciate you, like your expertise. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's been a pleasure once again. Would it be okay to get that uh, document that you give to your clients for post-operation and we'll put that on a show note? Um, But yeah, I'm happy to provide that to you. All right, we'll add that on a show notes and then whatever else uh, link you want. Dr. Stanley, you're always welcome here. I'm looking forward to already our next um, (laughs) episode. (laughs) That's right. That sounds good. Me too. Yeah, thanks so much for your time. Um, I'm Turk Akbay. Jill Akbay. This Dr. is Dr. Stanley from Good Vets Montfort. Yes. Thanks so much for your time. This is Zen of Dog Ownership Podcast. Thanks for your time. And please follow uh, Dr. Stanley's link from the show notes. Thank you. Thank you.